trigger warning. If you're offended by political incorrectness, this telecast is not for you. When did political correctness begin? And why do we have it? Who's behind it? And where is it leading us? Is it humorous, harmless, or hurtful? And should we fall in line with the ever-changing language landscape referred to as PC? Here's another important question. What would Jesus do? Would he be led about by social engineers as a bull is with a ring in his nose? Or would he be politically incorrect? And how can we know? Most of us living today have grown up with the constantly changing language of political correctness. The term itself became part of our vocabulary in the 1960s and 70s, when drugs, rampant sex, and Vietnam War protesters flooded American university campuses. The change in how we expressed ourselves often appeared silly, foolish, and laughable. But is it to be laughed off? Stay tuned as I'll show you what is behind PC and answer the question of what Jesus would do. A warm welcome to all of you from all of us here at Tomorrow's World where today I'm addressing the subject commonly referred to as political correctness. Have you ever considered what's behind this ever-changing language landscape? Where did it begin? And what's the end goal of those promoting it? Boston University Professor Emeritus Angelo Cotavilla explains, The notion of political correctness came into use among communists in the 1930s, as a semi-humorous reminder that the party's interest is to be treated as a reality that ranks above reality itself. He explains that it began as a joke among Communist Party insiders, as in, Comrade, your statement is factually incorrect. Yes, it is, but it is politically correct. Conservative author Bill Lind asks an important question that too few consider and he sees it holistically as part of a greater picture. Where does all this stuff that you've heard about this morning, the victim, feminism, the gay rights movement, the invented statistics, the rewritten history, the lies, the demands, all the rest of it, where does it come from? Lynn then confirms PC's Marxist-Leninist underpinnings and warns that there is nothing humorous about its intended goal. The name originated as something of a joke, literally in a comic strip, and we tend still to think of it as only half serious. In fact, it's deadly serious. It is the great disease of our century, the disease that has left tens of millions of people dead in Europe, in Russia, in China, indeed around the world. It is the disease of ideology. PC is not funny. PC is deadly serious. It's a mistake to think of political correctness in isolation. It's part of a greater political movement as indicated by Cotavilla and Lind. Many in America think in political terms of liberal, meaning left, and conservative, meaning right, but fail to recognize that there is both liberal and left, and these are not the same. Leftists, unlike liberals, are socialist totalitarians. Let's call them what they are, Marxists, and they're working to destroy America and other Western countries. It should be obvious to anyone taking an objective view of what is taking place around us that their goal is to tear down Western democratic nations and make them into something very different from their roots. As self-confessed liberal Kirsten Powers explains in The Silencing, How the Left is Killing Free Speech, the left is not liberal, but illiberal, sometimes referred to as progressive. And who isn't for progress? Powers writes, on campuses there are speech codes, so-called free speech zones, and a host of anti-discrimination policies that discriminate against people who dissent from lefty groupthink. Christian and conservative groups have been denied official university status by student government organizations for holding views not in line with the liberal dogma. The illiberal left's attempts to control the public debate are frequently buttressed by a parade of childish grievances. 
they portray life's vagaries as violations of their basic human rights and demand the world stop traumatizing them with facts and ideological views that challenge their belief system. They insist colleges provide trigger warnings on syllabi to prevent them from stumbling upon a piece of literature that might deal with controversial or difficult issues that could upset them. The illiberal left yearns for a world sanitized of information that offends them. The goal of the illiberal left is to tear down and destroy. PC is merely one tool in a broader campaign that involves denigrating authority, destroying the nuclear family, and controlling speech, behavior, and yes, even thought. While tomorrow's world is not political, we can call out and expose the ultimate object of their campaign of destruction. They seek a world without God. They wish to forever remove the moral underpinnings of an orderly world that are found in the Bible. The Bible is God's instruction book, a manual for mankind to know how to live. Lynn minced no words when he explained nearly 24 years ago, quote, political correctness is cultural Marxism. It is Marxism translated from economic into cultural terms. The totalitarian nature of political correctness is revealed nowhere more clearly than on college campuses, where the student or faculty member who dares to cross any of the lines set up by the gender feminist or the homosexual rights activists or the local black or Hispanic group or any of the other sainted victims groups that PC revolves around quickly finds themselves in judicial trouble. That is a little look into the future that political correctness intends for the nation as a whole. But this subject is only one tool in a greater movement undermining the foundations of Western civilization. And that movement seeks to remove God and His Word from our world forever. Consider where we are today. As explained in the first portion of this program, what we see is nothing less than Marxist totalitarian dogma. And it's no longer confined to university campuses. It has crept into education at all levels, including the earliest introduction to children's education. It's everywhere, from the military to media to business, large and small. It's expected and enforced. Corporate America, and this is not confined to America alone, in too many cases is now requiring employees to declare their preferred pronouns below their names, even if it is simply Mr. He and Him or Mrs. She and Her. To not do so is to put one's job at risk. And that's where we are today. Who would have thought we would see such things even as recently as 10 years ago? Political correctness is often viewed by sincere and naive people as an attempt to be compassionate and non offensive to an ever growing list of individuals placed in protective categories. According to one website, some examples of which I'll refer to in this program, the politically correct euphemisms help us to avoid discriminating against other people on the grounds of age, appearance, gender, health, personality, race, relationship status, religion, social status, and work. Now here are a few examples listed by this source. Instead of saying able-bodied, say non-disabled. Instead of dead, say terminally unavailable. Instead of deaf, use hearing impaired. Instead of blind, use sight impaired. And instead of elderly or old people, say senior citizens. And here's my favorite when it comes to foolishness. Instead of bald, say follically challenged. Individually and superficially, some of these language modifications may appear harmless or humorous, even compassionate. But referring to someone as follically challenged is nothing short of silliness. At the same time as brought out by Kirsten Powers, young people are being indoctrinated into the idea that they should be offended by any perceived slight. The term used to describe these offenses is microaggressions. One must wonder what the future holds for an overly sensitive generation offended by almost anything. 
How will they cope in life if the story of Old Yeller places them in deep depression because they experience the loss of their beloved dog? Such a personal event is painful. I understand that firsthand. But it's part of life. And as the saying goes, at some point, get over it. So why are these social engineers doing this? What is their end game? Dr. Cotavilla asks, why does the American left demand ever new PC obeisances? He goes on to explain, in 2012, no one would have thought that defining marriage between one man and one woman, as enshrined in US law, would brand those who do so as motivated by a culpable psychopathology called homophobia, subject to fines and near outlaw status. Note the dishonest use of language is employed here. If you disagree with homosexuality, for any reason, you must be phobic, fearful. It's not politically correct to say so, but that's a lie. Cordovilla continues, Not until 2015 or 16 did it occur to anyone that requiring persons with male personal plumbing to use public bathrooms reserved for men was a sign of the same pathology. Why had not these become part of the PC demands previously? Why is there no canon of PC that, once filled, would require no further additions? Because the point of PC is not, and has never been merely about any of the items that it imposes, but about the imposition itself. Probably not all people behind political correctness are avowed Marxists. But they understand that how people express themselves linguistically changes how they think. And don't be naive. These people are dedicated to changing the way that you and I think. While some changes appear humorously silly, others have a darker reason behind them. To turn upside down all biblical and traditional values and bring about an amoral, anything-goes world. Immoral choices are promoted. But if that choice brings tragic results, it's never one's fault. A drug addict must be referred to as someone who is chemically dependent. This deflects personal responsibility and the stigma of the truth. After all, much of current pop psychology involves convincing us that whether we are addicted to drugs, abusing alcohol, overeating, hopelessly and credit card debt, or chronically late for work, it is not our fault. Tardiness syndrome is the label, but frankly, your boss doesn't care about labels. Show up for work on time or be fired. Or as PC puts it, become a victim of restructuring. Much of what is called PC goes beyond a distraction. It's dishonest deception. When we know someone who is clumsy and refer to him as uniquely coordinated, it's as though he, first of all, is coordinated, just different from the rest of us. An illegal alien is exactly that. But these social engineers don't want us to state the truth. To them, he is neither illegal nor an alien, but an undocumented worker. Such an expression deflects from the truth that he is in the country illegally. Juvenile delinquents become children at risk. Now, of course, they are children at risk because they're delinquent. And here is one that MS Word seeks to change. Mankind to humankind. Now, while humankind is a legitimate word, why the insistence on avoiding the equally legitimate word mankind? What is behind this is something quite sinister. It's part of a broad design to denigrate both men and women and the roles they play in society. Anything with man in it must be changed. Man on the street to average person. Man up to be brave. Man whole to maintenance whole. Man made to synthetic. And manpower to workforce. And rather than man or woman, they would like us to simply say people. Why? Is it too difficult to discern the agenda behind it all? The attack against the way we were made is relentless and political correctness is a powerful tool to transform the way we think. 
What may have appeared silly and humorous at first has become a relentless attack on normality and morality. Nowhere is there a more sinister attempt to change thinking than in the matter of the way God made us, male and female. Even if an American Supreme Court justice cannot tell us what a woman is, any normal thinking person without an agenda or panel to satisfy can. You are here, able to understand this, as a result of a sperm from a man and an ovum or egg from a woman coming together and carried in the womb of a woman, not a man. But how often we hear people fall prey to leftist jargon, as in, quote, the gender assigned at birth. No, dear friends, it is not assigned, it's biology. And every right-minded person knows that. We should not fall for such destructive word games. Yes, there is a very small percentage of people who are born intersex, meaning that their genitalia are ambiguous. But to use this rare fact is a ruse. These are not the men competing in women's sports or invading women's changing rooms. These are not the girls encouraged by social media to solve their teenage insecurities by taking testosterone, binding their chests, or worse. I said I would answer the question, would Jesus be led about by political correctness? The answer is quite simply no. God does not conform to mankind's agenda-driven word games of oppression wrapped in compassion. He calls human actions as they truly are. 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verse 9 tells us, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. God does not sugarcoat immorality, paper over lies, or fail to punish for unrepented sin. He says it as it is in Revelation, the 21st chapter, and in verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Furthermore, the prophet Isaiah condemns those who play word games and turn language upside down, calling evil good and good evil. It is God who is the reliable source determining right from wrong. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Supposedly intelligent university students may not be able to tell you how many sexes there are, yet for most of us, it's quite simple. A child is born and parents rejoice over a boy or a girl. Until recently, they did not fret over some dishonest, socialist-inspired construct that the newborn falls within a spectrum. They naturally understood by observation. While addressing the Pharisees, Jesus confirms what Moses recorded in Genesis 1, that there are only two sexes, noted in Matthew, the 19th chapter, and in verse 4. And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. None of this is meant to say that we should needlessly offend anyone. The Apostle Paul instructed the people of Colossae in the fourth chapter and verse 6, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And when Jesus came and spoke in his hometown synagogue, Luke the fourth chapter, verse 22, all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Yet he did not shy away from speaking the truth to them. He, nor we, should enter into someone's fantasy world of confusion. We should speak the truth. And Jesus was never concerned about pleasing men, paving over the truth, nor being politically correct. The result of his honesty with those of his hometown is found a few verses later. 
So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Yes, there is sometimes danger in speaking the truth. And doing so requires two things, honesty and courage. Political correctness is seen by many to be either silly and harmless or caring and compassionate. It may be silly, but it's not harmless. It's not caring and it's not compassionate. Satan is the father of lies and he must revel in the party joke, comrade, your statement is factually incorrect. Yes, it is, but it is politically correct. As Bill Lynn concluded his campus report, and that was 24 years ago, he said, in conclusion, America, and I'll add Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and some other countries, today is in the throes of the greatest and direst transformation in its history. We are becoming an ideological state, a country with an official state ideology enforced by the power of the state. In hate crimes, we now have people serving jail sentences for political thoughts. And the Congress is now moving to expand that category ever further. It's exactly what we have seen happen in Russia, in Germany, in Italy, in China. And now it's coming here. And we don't recognize it because we call it political correctness and laugh it off. My message today is that it's not funny. It's here, it's growing, and it will eventually destroy as it seeks to destroy everything that we have ever defined as our freedom and our culture. Political correctness is a part of a larger agenda at work today. There's nothing innocuous about it. It may not have been around when Jesus walked the earth, but understand from the scriptures that Jesus and his servants would not have fallen prey to an agenda hostile to scripture. I hope you profited from this video. If you found it helpful and want to learn more, be sure to get your free DVD, A Culture in Crisis, by clicking the link in the description or go to twtv.org crisis. We here at Tomorrow's World want to help you understand your world through the pages of the Bible. So be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss another video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.